Good evening. Thanks for staying uh, after beers. Thanks for staying so late on a Monday evening. Uh, I'll present to you in the next, I guess, 30 minutes. I speak very fast. One of the reasons why India is doing so well in the global economy is we speak at Indian broadband speed. So uh, I can speak in 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 45 minutes. You tell me when to stop, and I'll stop, OK? Yeah. Um, I'll present to you some results from a couple of book series which I edit. One is called the Asia-Pacific Internet Handbook. We sort of have used the Star Wars metaphor. You know, Episode 4 is the first book. Then comes 5, 6, 7. Then I will sell the rights to 1, 2, and 3 for a few million dollars to somebody who wants to write the old books. Uh, we also look at some of the trends with mobile within companies. How do companies use mobile enterprise, etc., within Asia and other parts of the world. And we also started a book series about IT in Africa. A lot of people think Africa is, you know, all those politically incorrect terms like the dark continent, the black hole, all that stuff. But there's a lot of very exciting stuff happening in Africa, and my lovely colleague will speak after this about what's happening in Africa in terms of opportunities for mobile, wireless, etc. The other hat I wear is a world music editor for Rave magazine. What's very interesting now is how the internet and mobile is smashing and morphing the music industry in different ways. Uh, developing countries often get uh, slammed by many IPR organizations saying uh, a lot of piracy of software and music and movies happens in developing countries. But many of us have a different view of piracy. There's a very nice term called beneficiary piracy, which means up to a certain extent, piracy is perfectly fine because it makes people aware of software. It makes people aware of how to learn different kinds of tools. It exposes them to Western culture, etc. So I call that return on imitation, ROI. The more you're imitated, the better returns you get in the long term. And uh, it's also the sign of quality. If you're not a good musician, no one's going to pirate your series. So have respect for the digital pirates. Give them a good reason to pirate your stuff. So you have to be good. Your music has to be good enough to pirate. Uh, the flip side of that equation is how to perform in this new age of di uh, digital and mobile music, which is let the CDs be loss leaders. You make your money from performance, from live performances. It's not a new radical theory. There's a band called The Grateful Dead, which used to use this model back in the 60s and 70s. Their model was, you like our music? Come to the concert. You want to tape this stuff? Tape it. You want to make money by selling those tapes to other people? Go for it. Fantastic model. We should do more of that in this day and age. A topic for conversation over uh, drinks, of course. I'll give you a, a framework first to talk about how to analyze the mobile ecosystem in uh, developing countries and developed countries. First of all, by the way, for the record, I don't like these terms developing and developed so much because if you're going to classify the world into developed and developing, you must also classify the developed countries into wrongly developed, overdeveloped, misdeveloped, <laughs> maldeveloped, etc. So that's another political question we can talk about afterwards. So thank you. So let's use the word emerging economies for want of a better word. Um, this is a framework that we've used in our book series to compare how do different information societies perform in uh, the digital economy in terms of knowledge, mobile, etc. These are all the HCs, very self-explanatory. Connectivity is uh, what do people connect with in terms of bandwidth, cost, tariffs, operators, etc. Content is what do they do? Uh, SMS, mobile, uh, sorry, SMS, voice, MMS. Community is the community social networking aspects of new media. Then you come to the more fuzzy part. What is the culture of the country? Is it a very politically repressive regime? Uh, in various countries, SMS and Twitter has opened up the discourse in many areas. In other countries, uh, Google is being censored, various Western websites are being blocked, etc. cetera. Um, ca uh, capacity is the human resource aspect of it. How good is a country performing in terms of developing content and services for the new media? This is where countries in Asia, such as India, are doing very well. A lot of jobs from the West are being offshored to India. So if you guys don't do your job, we'll do your job for you. Then there is cooperation, which is how does a country grow the whole ecosystem in terms of creating good uh, partnership agreements between, say, operators, content providers, and startups. In many countries, a big challenge is the operator keeps 90 plus percent of the revenues from any kinds of content. But in some countries, like Japan, the operator keeps only 10 percent and gives 90 percent to the whole uh, ecosystem of startups, content providers, etc. So that is sort of the cooperation model. Then there is commerce. Can you actually go a step beyond content and information? To transactive. Can you actually transact on the mobile phone? Can you buy and sell, etc.? And here are some very unusual, interesting experiments are coming out of Africa, out of the Philippines, where people actually are paying using the cell phone. We heard earlier on examples of how no longer do you have to worry about not having enough change to pay your taxi driver or the waiter or whatever. You can use your mobile phone to pay all this stuff. And finally, capital. Who's going to pay for all this stuff? Who's going to invest in the next generation of mobile startups? Who are the VCs in this space? What are some ROI models for VCs to get into mobile space, et cetera? The other side of our framework is how to look at mobile and new media in two different ways. One is using new media 
and the other is creating new media content applications, etc. So this is where some countries are very good at adopting uh, different kinds of models, different kinds of services, but they may not be so good at creating that stuff. So this also creates different kinds of dynamics for countries who are mature or leading in terms of the information society. So if you marry these two, the HCs and the two I's, you can tell I'm a consultant, you get this thing, uh, a list of our framework of evolution of different kinds of information societies. So instead of just saying developing countries or emerging economies, I would suggest this might be a bit more of a useful framework. There are some countries which are very restrictive. If you are in Myanmar or North Korea, tough luck in terms of sending out different kinds of content about government corruption and all that stuff. So over here, the market is more for NGOs, civil society groups who can open up the discourse, different kinds of solutions for free speech. There's a whole bunch of groups working in this area. Then you have embryonic countries which don't have so much of a repressive regime, but they're trying to build their infrastructure. Countries like Afghanistan, who've had their whole infrastructure bombed out by the various superpowers in the past, they're now trying to rebuild their infrastructure and get into the information society. So here the challenge is, how do you build from a completely bombed out infrastructure, build wireless networks, build different kinds of services? So here there's a very good chance for these countries to leapfrog into new kinds of uh, services and whatnot. Then you have emerging countries. They've been trying to get into the information society broadband age for a long time, but they have very serious real geographic constraints. Nepal is right in the middle of the Himalaya mountains. You can't dig up half the Himalayas to put fiber. You have to use things like WiMAX, mobile, etc., to get access to the people. So for these countries, wireless is the only solution in terms of getting into the information age. So for mobile, this is a terrific market to look at. Then you have countries like China, which are big players in the hardware sort of end of the mobile ecosystem, but they're very nervous about the free flow of information that goes with this. So these are negotiating countries. They're negotiating the good, the infrastructure, the economy of new media, but they're very nervous about the political culture that comes with it. So every other day you hear reports of Google, Google being blocked, Twitter being blocked in different countries such as this. India's gone a bit beyond that. We don't have such big issues of political censorship. Of course, India and the Philippines are in this area, but we have very real problems in terms of access in rural areas. Broadband is a bit of a problem. Electricity is definitely a problem in many parts of India and other developing countries as well. Then in the Asia Pacific, you have mature countries, countries like Australia, very high penetration of mobile 3G, Wi-Fi, etc. But they're not very good uh, in projecting this in, uh, to other countries, other parts of the world. I can't name any mobile phones made in Australia which are sold in Bolivia and stuff like that. Whereas you have countries like Japan and South Korea who are leading in adoption of wireless. The number one countries in the world for mobile banking, st mobile stock trading, everything is in Korea. The largest penetration of WiMAX, again, Vibro, their own version of WiMAX, is again in South Korea. And they also project this stuff outside of their countries. So it's easier for infrastructure players to do this, but a bit harder for content players to do this. Not many people can name the top seven Japanese actresses and the top seven Korean music stars, even though Samsung and other such companies' products are used in many countries around the world. So advanced can be a bit of a lopsided thing. You can be very advanced in infrastructure services exposure, but not so much in content and services. So this is our framework for how different kinds of emerging economies are going down the spectrum. And accordingly, if you are techies looking for partners, if investors looking for players, <clears throat> a, good bet to do, a good bet would be to invest in infrastructure in some of the emerging economies, to invest more in content and high-end payment services in negotiating, and try to find partners and stay away from competitors from the other countries. Okay, um, I'll talk in, uh, in my talk in two segments. Uh, the first part will be sort of the, the market, the market in emerging economies, which is all the, the numbers, the technology, the sales, etc. We obviously have all the numbers. If you look at all the big uh, top 10 countries, a huge number of them are all in the emerging economies of the world. So if you're looking to sell whatever, uh, shoes, handphones, whatever, these are obviously very good markets. What's very interesting now is some of these emerging economies, some of these developing countries, are actually changing the game now. Good example is India. Uh, a lot of people began to think that, yes, India is a good place where we can sell a lot of phones, etc. We can get some cheap uh, coding, etc. done over there. That was the entry point in the 80s. Now they're moving into speed. As you can see, Indians talk very fast, we innovate very fast. So a lot of companies are staying on because the quality is good, the pace of innovation is very nice, etc. And that's why companies are expanding their presence in, in developing countries. So that is some of the challenge that I will end towards the end. Uh, I'll give a list of sort of predictions for the year 2030, which is many emerging economies will be good markets for you guys. Some of them will be very good partners for some of you, but many will be your competitors. So watch out. Now, I'll switch uh, for the second part now to a bit more of the human aspect, the human aspects of uh, people who use mobile phones. So I'll now talk about people as citizens, as individuals, not just consumers. This is a quote from an earthquake. Uh, there was an earthquake in China last year. 
and I asked some of my friends, you know, hey, are you guys okay, etc. And one of them sent me this email saying, yes, we are fine, but guess what? This, this incident happened. It was a mom, her child was, uh, uh, she was protecting her baby. She died, but she had an unsent SMS message saying, you know, remember, if you live and you see this message, please know that I love you. Very powerful uh, effect this had on people in the mobile community, and they said, ouch, this is our social responsibility. We must build good disaster awareness uh, systems. We must have uh, alliances between uh, disaster, natural di uh, disease monitoring systems, and mobile uh, uh, broadcasting systems, etc. Um, so I would say this is my top 10 list of um, what are key areas where, is it 10 years? Yes, there are 10. A top 10 impact areas for mobile media. First of all, disaster reporting and relief. I live, for instance, in Asia, a part of the world which has uh, gorgeous men, lovely women, superb music, fantastic spicy food, and all that stuff. But we also have, unfortunately, tsunamis, hurricanes, earthquakes, a lot of natural disasters. So disaster reporting and relief is one of the first areas where mobile has made a very big impact already in many parts of the uh, emerging economies. Second, in some countries where there is not enough human rights and freedom of expression, internet and mobile has opened up the space for op uh, airing of opinions, what not. Uh, healthcare, we are in the era of H1N1, SARS, all these kinds of very strange, super funky diseases. And uh, mobile is, plays a very important role in warning people about what can happen, which are areas to watch out. I know many schools in India who had uh, uh, very worried that uh, a lot of kids were not coming to the school because the parents said, oh no, if you go there, you'll get H1N1, all that stuff. So many schools now send broadcast SMSs to all the students saying, no H1N1, please come to school tomorrow, do your homework by two in the afternoon, etc. Then there is uh, poverty alleviation, how to give people jobs in this, how to give people jobs in terms of maybe repairing cell phones, uh, selling and distributing cell phones, um, how to give them access to information, how to give them access to education, using you know, everything from Wi-Fi in schools to education quizzes on SMS. Uh, improving the environment, environment monitoring is a big challenge in many developing countries. You've all been following the big scandals in China where all this breakneck growth is coming at the cost of a lot of environmental depredation. So how can mobiles use, be used by citizens to monitor what's happening in their environment, in their neighborhoods, etc. Social inclusion, getting people access to be acknowledged as citizens. What we found very interestingly was uh, the mobile phone is very strongly attached to by people, not just in the big cities in, in Asia, but the very small towns and the villages. Why? Because they had nothing before that. They never had TV, they didn't have a telephone, they never had internet, there were no internet cafes in many of these small towns. The first piece of high technology they got was the mobile phone. And it means so much to these people. So for social inclusion, it's very important to increase what kinds of services and content you can put on these phones, especially to people in remote parts of the world, in mountains and remote plains, etc. Connecting diaspora, uh, what's very interesting about many emerging economies is we have a huge diaspora population outside our countries. There are about 40 million people of Chinese origin living outside mainland China, about 20 million uh, people of Indian origin living outside of India. I see a few of them over here. Hi. Uh, there are also maybe 8 million people of Vietnamese origin living outside of Vietnam. Uh, I believe in Africa, the number is how much? 50 million? 50 million people of African origin living outside of Africa. And for us, the internet and mobile is the best medium to stay connected with our culture, our roots, to contribute to different kinds of fundraising campaigns, etc. through the mobile. I'll give you some examples. Cultural preservation, again, preserving our natural cultures is a big challenge with globalization. A lot of people think this rap hip-hop culture is going to drown out a lot of local ethnic music in different parts of the world, but this is where new media can help in cultural preservation. Then, of course, government transparency and accountability. Unfortunately, many emerging economies have very corrupt countries, uh, very corrupt uh, governments and regimes. Hopefully, mobile can allow people to report on corrupt officials, etc. There are a couple of good ex experiments in Bangalore with an NGO called Janagraha, which allows citizens to report on, I'm seeing this open ditch for so many weeks, when they say they'll fill it up within two weeks. So all this stuff goes into a big database, and you can actually hold your councillors accountable, saying, how come you haven't fixed this kind of stuff for the last X number of weeks, etc. And of course, finally, the increasing the business advantage to the small, uh, small and medium enterprises, how to increase access to the informal labor sector. I think this is one terrific application of mobile. If you have a good combination of web and mobile and different kinds of interactive services, you can actually tap into a lot of informal labor. I talked to our friend here yesterday who was talking about uh, an organization which his mother works for, where uh, uh, Dutch mothers, grandmothers knit certain kinds of uh, uh, souvenirs, etc., certain kinds of garments, and these are sold to tourists and various other people in the Netherlands. Now, if you could build a network of grandmothers who are free on Friday afternoons and want to knit blue sweaters in a so-and-so pattern, and plug all this into a big database, and make this available during festive seasons, shopping, Christmas, etc., you could tap into amazing kinds of informal labor. So I think these, there are good examples of this I'll give you in uh, developing countries as well. 
I'll begin with the first. I'll give you some examples only in five of these for reasons of time. I mean, even at my speed, I can't give you all examples for everything. Um, mobile alerting systems. I talked about SMS warnings for a tsunami. Many countries have a national aware, uh, disaster awareness program to help people become aware of what's happening. Citizen reporting during disasters about um, where are fires still breaking out after an earthquake. Um, a huge amount of work also in, I'm, I'm assuming uh, that we're talking mostly here about, uh, we've been talking generally in Mobile Monday about uh, mobile and uh, those kinds of consumer applications. But there's a whole new world in the internet of things. When you start connecting things using RFID, using Wi-Fi, WiMAX, uh, mesh networks, Zigbee, uh, wireless heart, there's a whole world of blue collar sort of internet of things that's happening on there. And when these two internets converge, the internet of people and the internet of things, we see some very interesting stuff happening. Um, other examples, uh, Cyclone Nargis in Myanmar, etc. Let me give you some quick screenshots. This is a fundraising campaign launched in Malaysia to raise funds by SMS for the victims of the cyclone in Myanmar, across the border. This was during the Chinese earthquake. Again, uh, there was, after the first earthquake, a lot of fear that there would be aftershocks and there'd be more panic, etc. So the government told the people, relax, there's no aftershocks. Our, our results show that there is no uh, aftershock that's going to happen. Uh, this is when some of the private sector operators, the China Mobile, Baidu, Tencent, various other Chinese operators, they also said, we will now uh, offer you a chance to donate to campaigns by SMS. So this is a very quick way for you to tap into the need for people to want to pay and donate money to uh, campaigns of this kind. Um, other very interesting examples emerging, I'll start off with Asia. Uh, my friend here will talk about Africa after this. Uh, in Japan, even though it's a developed country, has some certain serious issues with how to give older people access to all this nice stuff coming on the mobile phone. My parents, for instance, don't do any of this fancy mobile gaming stuff. They just want voice, maybe a bit of SMS on the phone. So what will we do like, what will we be like when we grow, you know, 80, 100, whatever years old? Will we use all these fancy smartphones or do we need reduced set, reduced instruction set kind of uh, uh, mobile phones? China already covered. In India, the big challenge that we are facing is we have a lot of very good techies in places like Bangalore, but the big challenge is how do we get them to plug into social networks, into NGO networks, communication campaigns, healthcare NGOs, etc. How do we get techies to talk to non-techies to see what they can do to bridge this gap? So we're talking with organizations like Mobile Active, mobileactive.org, to see if we can create a wiki, a matchmaking wiki. I am an organization which wants to increase awareness about you know, domestic abuse or whatever. And somebody else says, I'm a techie, I can give you SMS solutions for broadcasting different kinds of healthcare messages. Can we sort of match make these people together and get them to do different kinds of solutions? Uh, Philippines, uh, one of the world's leading capitals in terms of per capita SMS. Uh, the Philippines is uh, the first country in the world where a government was brought down from power in part because of an SMS coordinated movement. Um, it also is one of the leaders in mobile remittances. Many Filipinos work in uh, the Middle East and many uh, of their employees in the Middle East send money back through SMS remittances to their loved ones back in, uh, in, in, in the Philippines. We are seeing similar models now spreading across Africa, other parts of Asia like India as well. I talked about Nepal, a very good case study, of course, in Bangladesh is the microfinance model. There's a guy called Mohammed Yunus who won the Nobel Prize for his whole microfinance model, which is how to give people loans of uh, you know, five euros to buy a goat, 10 euros to buy a cow in some village. These are loans of sizes which no bank would want to touch and which are very expensive to process in terms of workflow and stuff like that. But if you use mobiles and you have microfinance organizations with smartphones, I've seen case studies of companies, uh, NGOs like Ek Gaon, one village in, in Hindi, uh, which actually go to remote parts of India and they have the entire workflow on a smartphone and they can actually process applications for loans of two euros, five euros, et cetera, to give people these kinds of loans. They've extended this to sort of a mobile village model, which is a, a village phone ladies. You give a woman a cell phone, she walks around different villages and lets people make phone calls. So it's like a mobile, a walking PCO, public call office. So this is called the village phone ladies model. So the Grameen Bank has incubated a company called Grameen Telephone, which has incubated another company called Grameen Phone. So all these three companies have a very good ecosystem of uh, po uh, pollinating this kind of information. So if you do a Google search on microfinance and banking, you'll get some fantastic reports. There are more people in the world with mobile phones than banking accounts. So in many countries where there's no access to capital for citizens, there's no choice but to go through the mobile phone to get access to capital. Um, this is another quote from uh, in Africa about social inclusion. The phone has transformed the women's farmers' lives completely. This is an experiment to give farmer, uh, women farmers access to the mobile phone and thereby to information about prices, etc. I think our next speaker will talk more about this as well. Um, some other examples, uh, uh, the presentations will be with the organizers and you can check out all these websites at your own leisure. Uh, for instance, IKSL gives uh, farming information in Indian languages to farmers in voice or in SMS. Uh, a very good example of a student startup in Bangalore is suruk.com. This was started by two students who came from out of Bangalore 
to Bangalore and they found that since they didn't speak the local language, Kannada, or the local rickshaw drivers, the tuk-tuk drivers would rip them off. So what these guys did was they said, if you're going to tuk-tuk the next time, uh, take a note of the number and SMS it to us and we'll tell you whether this guy is a good driver or not. So you can actually rate and rank the good drivers in your neighborhood. You can also get things like um, you go from point A to point B in the city and many people will say, oh, my meter's not working, pay 80 rupees. But uh, if you call these guys or send them an SMS, they will say, send me point A, send me point B, the distance is so much, the map shows so many kilometers, you should be only 40 rupees. And you can show this to the driver and then you can take him to the police if you want to, etc. So there's a very good <laughs> two students, students who came from out of Bangalore and didn't speak the local language, they started this company, Suruk.com. So terrific example of how socially minded entrepreneurs can actually make a very good living out of these kinds of applications and improve life for all of us. Informal labor is a very interesting area. I'll talk about this now. There are many companies looking at the informal labor sector, uh, looking at how to mobilize information for activists, for people working in the labor sector, etc. This is from uh, uh, an organization called the Tactical Technology Collective. They publish a number of books on interaction design for mobile activists on how to use different kinds of applications in mobile for people such as this company, Cell Bazaar. This is in Bangladesh. And you can, for instance, uh, if you want to buy green chilies, uh, the average Asian consumes 6.7 kilos of chilies every week or something like that. So these are green chilies, dry chilies from different kinds of areas. And you can find out who currently has just harvested a nice crop of green chili. And you can ask them, yes, I want this. Can you come to my house and can you sell this stuff, etc." This is another site called babajob.com. These guys got an award in the Mobile Monday Global Peer Awards ceremony in Barcelona. Uh, this past February, and these are sort of blue-collar, white-collar portals. So suppose I I'm going to have a party for my kids, but uh, well, I don't have any kids, my friends' kids, um, and they want to have a cook who can make North Indian food. I can go to this portal and say, who can come to my afternoon and cook North Indian food for two hours? So here are various cooks, blue, uh, some of them illiterate, who go to the centers of Baba Jobs and give in their information, and then I can say, yes, I want this woman to come and cook for me next Friday. And these guys will contact that woman and she'll come and cook for me on a Friday. So it sounds very trivial for a middle class family, but for these guys, it's a lot of money. It is an afternoon, extra afternoon, extra free afternoon spent to get some kind of a contract. So this kind of informal labor stuff, I think, is brilliant for a combination of web plus mobile. Um, in conclusion, some of the big areas that I see for uh, mobile in the emerging economies are entrepreneurship. Uh, there already are very good mechanisms in place. Mobile Monday is a good place, for instance, in Bangalore, one of the most active Mobile Monday chapters in the world, uh, uh, for uh, entrepreneurs to come together and talk about tech, biz, social trends, etc. Very good innovation funds in different parts of uh, Asia. If you want to look at venture capital and different kinds of areas, if you are interested in any aspects of these uh, wireless applications, such as integration, offshoring, a lot of good stuff happening over here. Some challenges that we face in developing countries, how to deal with the big guys. All the big guys, Microsoft and Reuters and uh, Nokia and whatnot, they've all read these nice books about bottom of the pyramid. So they're all jumping into these countries and trying to find out what to do. So in our event last week, for instance, on mobile activism, the 10% of the crowd was from Microsoft Research. And everyone was wondering, what is Microsoft Research doing in this kind of a forum? Isn't this about social entrepreneurship and stuff? So a lot of the small guys want to know, how do we deal with these big guys? Are they just going to swallow us up or can we form a good partnership? How do we negotiate with the big guys? So typical challenges for the entrepreneurs. So. If you want to come to emerging economies, my advice, some of my suggestions would be segment the market. I give you the list of different kinds of emerging economies. Decide whether you want to look for a partner, whether you want to look for uh, outsourcing sort of a, a deal, or just plain simply a market. Uh, there's a whole end of, there's a whole spectrum of issues in the mobile ecosystem where you can form partnerships, everything from R&D to innovation. Now, uh, Mark provoked me yesterday and said, uh, don't just give us an overview and uh, give you a nice you know, 30,000 feet to 10,000 feet overview. Provoke us and tell us what's going to happen in the future and scare us. So here are some of my scary and some of my feel-good predictions for not five-year plans. I don't believe in five-year plans anymore. You must think 20 years down the road and 20 weeks down the road. So just one year and 20 years. Five-year plans make no sense in this day and age. So 20 years down the road, what are some challenges? Spectrum. Uh, Fiber is potentially an infinite resource in a sense, but spectrum is finite. So we may run into challenges, perhaps, I'm not exactly sure. E-waste, the amount of waste that we go through in the PC world and now soon in the mobile world is going to be humongous. So environmentalists or they are very concerned about the e-waste of our whole uh, information system. Uh, from a research perspective, we still don't have good theoretical frameworks to explain what exactly mobile does in terms of, say, social activism, informal labor networks, et cetera. We don't yet have good theoretical models. The medium is so new as a social phenomenon that we don't have good theoretical frameworks as well. We are seeing in the area of innovation a very interesting concept called the micro-multinational. Three guys in Silicon Valley, four guys in Shanghai, three guys in Bangalore. 
running a mobile network for uh, mobile ringtones or something of that sort. Could never have been possible before the age of the internet, connecting people in different parts of the world. Now you don't even need to have the old vision of startups, which is I need an office, I need to buy a computer, I need to buy a network, I need to get servers, all that stuff. Everything is free on the net. You can go and release out sort of cloud computing, you know, as software as a service, mobile platforms as a service, all that stuff. So the very nature of innovation is being innovated as we speak. Personal knowledge management is going to become a very big uh, focus area. We all carry our smartphones, whatever, with us. So how do we go from our knowledge to the information is a very big challenge. Um, visioning scenario strategies, again, uh, I believe very strongly in this 20-year stepping method. Go back to where the world was in 1950. We didn't have the world developing countries at that time because we were all colonies. Most of us were colonies in 1950. So these terms are all very new. Developing countries, emerging economies, all are extremely new uh, models. Many of us are going to be very old in the coming uh, decades, I suppose. I am very scared of the day, sometime in the future, when I get up and I can't type anymore. So I'm keeping sort of one eye on assistive technologies, which can, you know, voice recognition, all of that stuff. I'm also very scared of the day when I get up and I can't have sex anymore, but that's a different <laughs> question altogether. Um, and finally, I'd leave you with the, what I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, which is in many emerging economies, you will find good markets, you will find good partners, you will also find competitors who will run you out of business. So be warned and form partnerships with Mobile Monday and you'll have a good future. Thank you. Whoa. <laughs> Thank you, madam. I, uh, ju just one question for me. Yes. Um, could you repeat some of the things that you left off after you introduced the Rave magazine? So uh, at least slide two or something. No, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> there are a lot of questions. Yes, very many questions to ask via Twitter. Um, let me start with uh, the question from Carol Loon. Where are you? Over there, hi. Um, question, disasters happen everywhere. Can developing countries export their technology to the developed world? For example, on December 31st, uh, New Year's Eve, all, the, all our nets are, uh, are overloaded. Yeah, can we go to five questions and cluster the answers together? Yeah. Yeah, can you? Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. It's a plot we have to take. I don't know the answer. But okay, no, yes, I'll take yes. up the challenge and yeah. see if you... Uh, okay. Um, will the weight of China and India change direction of the now Western development? Yes. Next question. How do we... <laughs> how do we empower entrepreneurs in developing countries oh, in the mobile market? Yes. And is charging the phones, e.g. By the, by the village lady, an issue in developing countries, like solar energy? And does Twitter have a chance to replace these SMS services? Oh, great question. Uh, you you have one minute. Yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, no, maybe, perhaps. That's the answer. Anyway, but, uh, oh. uh, and there's oh. another one. Yeah, but if you can manage. Yeah. What is the potential of cloud computing for all of this, specifically micro multinationals? Great. Um, I would say in the cities of uh, emerging economies, there is reasonably good infrastructure for people to plug into cloud computing. But if you go to smaller markets, it's very tough. You can't go to a tier two or a tier three city in India and expect to have good access to electricity all the time. So yes, cloud computing, the cloud will not exist for most people in emerging economies for many years to come simply because they don't have reliable broadband for, for a long time. Uh, the question of how to enable entrepreneurship in emerging economies, superb question. Uh, Mobile Monday is a good way. Uh, uh, one of our visions in Mobile Monday is not just to connect the founders and speakers of Mobile Monday, but to connect an entrepreneur in Bangalore or in Bogota who wants to come up with some kind of an innovative mobile content application, you know, integration framework, and sell that into Netherlands or the UK or something of that sort. So we want to create a matchmaking kind of a, a tool eventually in Mobile Monday to plug in entrepreneurs in different parts of the world. Already many other countries have a business plan competitions. So a good way to get involved would be to find out where a good business plan competition is happening and get involved at the student level. Uh, many industry lobbies such as the Cellular Operators Association of India, etc., incubate startups with more of an operator-centric model. So there are many ways to plug into innovation in uh, 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 emerging economies. I think our next speaker will talk some, about some of that as well. There's also the Ashoka Foundation, which invests in uh, several of these NGOs. Uh, one of the other questions was on how to uh, export disaster uh, yes. reporting technology to yeah. other parts of the world. Yeah, um, there, there, there are some companies working on how to get uh, uh, 
the phone number databases of people residing in different neighborhoods and send them a broadcast saying uh, the, this river has flooded, so this part of the city is under th uh, threat of flooding because the bank of the river is uh, burst, etc. But I think this isn't rocket science, and I think in developed countries also you can figure it out, but I think we can also share some other stuff, definitely. I know that in Japan, in Malaysia, in India, we now have different kinds of networks in place for warning people about, say, for instance, a tsunami. So this is connected to the Tsunami Alert Center. I think there's one near Japan somewhere in the Pacific, and coupled with some other satellite sensing systems, gateway to web and SMS uh, mechanism. So it's possible, yes. And uh, the other one was what? The charging. Sorry. Uh, charger, great question. I, I left out one very, I, I just briefly mentioned the question of electricity over here. Uh, a very big problem, obviously, for anyone who's been even to Bangalore is the perpetual power cuts. Every day we go through at least one or two power cuts of almost an hour each. So a very big serious issue is access to electricity in emerging economies. We're seeing some very good creative approaches coming here. One is there's a company, I forget the name, which does solar voltaic cells in India and they sell this solution to SMEs, small medium enterprises in different parts of India. And this actually allows even people who are in the garment business, very often people have to shut shop after dark because they can't work in, uh, on sewing machines and stuff. But now if you give them a solar voltaic cell, they can get light for at least maybe three or four hours after the end of the day. So many of these garment shops can work longer hours, they can give more jobs to people, etc. So we're seeing some action in solar. Um, I'm not seeing so much traction in one very interesting model which came about a few years back, which is the sort of the clockwork radio. You have a charger operated by hand, and I think that's a terrific model which I'm not seeing enough innovation at all. Uh, I personally could do with some of that stuff, and I'm very bored sometimes. Yes, can I up and charge up my phone or something? But How I'm not long seeing much of that stuff. To I'm to not sure. I've never seen those things. Anybody try? There was clockwork radio. Clockwork radio was you crank it for two hours, you get about 15 minutes of radio time, which is not so bad. But yeah. So let's conclude Ooh. with that. Thank you, Madame, again. Thank you, thank you. Warm applause. Oh, you can hold it. <laughs>